Hi, John. Good morning, Nick. I like your outfit. Uh, I like your British tie. Do you? Very smart. Yeah. Yeah, we have a bit of a problem in England. Some people call it post-colonial guilt. <laughs> I was going to wear my, uh, my, my England waistcoat, but you get accused of being the National France, so this is the best I could do. A little bit of blue and red in my bow tie. I've been accused of being an architect so far this morning. Mm. Um, I've also been accused of being uh, a snooker commentator. <laughs> but there we are. John, you, you Nigerians always put us in the shade. By the way, this is a, another uh, double act here. Where's uh, Lola? Lola! Please stand up. Yeah. The matching dress and hairdress, fantastic. Made and flown over from Nigeria months ago. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> John, we should uh, introduce ourselves uh, to people. Good morning, church. My name is John. I was born in Nigeria, but I live in North London now. And I am Nick. I was brought up on a farm in Lincolnshire with my lovely sister, who is over there, the beautiful one. And uh, I've lived in London since I was 19. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about church this morning, John, aren't we? Yeah. What's the funniest thing that's ever happened to you in church? Well, I remember about 25 years ago, I went to a church in Nigeria, and um, the first service, the pastor said, we were going to fast. I didn't know what that was. So I went on eating my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> and then the next day, we had a prayer meeting, and we all came to church, and uh, they said, okay, has everyone, anyone fasted today? And I said, yes. We fasted. And my mom says, no, you didn't fast. You had breakfast, you had lunch, you had dinner. <laughs> and uh, that was for seven days. Then the next uh, Sunday, which is the eighth day, the pastor came and said, we're going to fast for 100 days. I said, no chance. <laughs> I, I tried my best, but I think about the third day I couldn't continue, so I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That would have been something, wouldn't it? There wasn't, wouldn't, presuming not much left of that church. No. <laughs> no. Um, I remember uh, many years ago at New Life, um, we've always uh, uh, encouraged people to worship in their own style. And uh, one evening, a visitor came along, a very smartly dressed visitor, and um, uh, asked uh, a, a couple on the front row, uh, he had a very beautiful wife, uh, he came up to uh, this uh, young lady and said to, to the husband, uh, would you mind if I have this dance? And much to her horror, he said, help yourself. <laughs> as he took her a, 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 across the board at a quick foxtrot. So that was, uh, that was an unusual one. Anyway, John, um, something a little bit more serious. What, how would you define church? Well, uh, my understanding is church is not the building. Church is Jesus' idea. His idea of redemption, his idea of salvation, is idea of hope and comfort to all mankind. And what about your uh, experience of church, John? Well, unfortunately, the church hasn't been up to standard in many cases. And that's because man chooses his own ways. Jesus said, I will build my own church. And Jesus' idea of church was a place where we all come to get support, to support one another, in the race for salvation. Okay, um, I agree, John, and I think many people are put off church for various reasons. Um, the church, as people know it, has um, uh, done many bad things in the name of Christ and uh, individuals as well. Um, I think that uh, one of the, the, uh, the, the reasons is that the church is not always in a good state. Throughout history, the church seems to have ebbed and flowed. Sometimes it's been full of life, and uh, then after a while, uh, the life seems to have ebbed away. And I think in the days of the, these days of the internet, <clears throat> it only takes one bad story uh, to affect the way that people feel about church. But many good things, many, many good things ha happen today across the world um, because of the two billion people that call themselves Christians. Yes, uh, generally I think church is a very good idea. Uh, my Two boys, my lovely daughter and wife, I joined uh, New Life a couple of years ago, and it has been an amazing experience for us every single day. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. 
Um, one of the things uh, that, that we love to do here at New Life, if you don't know New Life, and it's lovely to have a few visitors here today, um, is to work with other churches. And we, it, we don't just do this um, as a token, um, as something that looks good, but we have a very good relationship uh, with other churches. The leaders get together, pray together uh, once a month. We have breakfast from time to time. Um, we uh, do outreach together. We do the Fleet Festival at Whitson. At Easter and Christmas, we have joint services. And uh, I really like this because that's different, I think, to uh, the experience that many people have of, of churches. Yes, when I joined New Life, um, like I said, a couple of years ago, I realized that you ran um, the food bank program. And I felt really blessed by that. Yeah. Um, and as I say, it's something we just do with, with the other churches. Mm. Uh, we also try to avoid uh, divisions over minor differences, which can be very off-putting to people. Yeah. Well, I think I agree. Uh, church, unfortunately, do compete with one another. And this was not Jesus' idea. Yeah. Um, I like the idea that church isn't a place for perfect people. Um, the church, is, to me, is more like a hospital for all of us in the world, uh, where bad people are getting better. And um, you probably remember the story that Billy Graham told about the woman who said that she was looking for the perfect church. And what was his answer? He told her she'd never find a perfect church. He said, to her, Madam, when you join it, we'll, we'll no longer be perfect. <laughs> I suppose it's inevitable that Christians will cause some offence in their lifetime then. Um, I think that's true, John. Uh, I think we all cause offence to one another in our lives, even when we don't intend to. I had a print shop for many years, and we had every kind of customer. We had some really lovely customers. Uh, we had some really difficult customers, and some who shouted at us down the phone. And, uh, yeah, that was... Hmm. But how did you deal with that, Nick? Um, mainly, we, often we just tried to be patient and let the, the moment roll over you. Sometimes we had to deal with the situation in a, in a way that didn't cause uh, any more offence. And uh, I was certainly glad to be a Christian because there were times when you could draw on that patience and gentleness and kindness. But um, uh, there were times when I definitely didn't succeed and uh, I uh, lost my cool. Um, but um, I think it's much more difficult when you're offended by people who you really trust. I agree with you, Nick. That is why sometimes people do get hurt. They, got, they get hurt because of their expectations. The higher the expectations, the higher the demand, and the higher the likelihood of getting hurt. And sometimes, genuinely, for no reasons of ours, we do get hurt. And how would you, what advice would you give, John, to somebody who has been hurt by uh, people they trust? I think very often, the most hurt is encountered in families because, as John said, we have that expectation that we expect something better. And sadly, also in church situations, um, people become Christians. And as somebody once said, um, uh, they expect Christians to have wings under their jackets. In other words, the Christians might be angels. But we're not, are we? No, we are not, unfortunately. Uh, this is life. And as humans, we must realize that we have faults in ourselves. And we do hurt people and do demand forgiveness from people in as much as we also will want others to forgive us. Jesus always said this. He said, I understand that as long as you're human, you will offend one another. And this is comforting for me, knowing that I will offend you and I'll know that sometimes you will offend me. But the closer you are to me, the more difficult it's going to get. One of the greatest offense I take as a person is from my wife, unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> that is because she's the love of my life, and when my food is five minutes late, I get very offended. 
I guess it's those practical things, John, isn't it? It's, a, it's a, a ironic, isn't it, that in family, uh, most, of the, um, most of the violence uh, in our country, and I'm sure across the world, actually happens in family situations because there is that expectation and because you let your guard down. People come to church, don't they? And sometimes they've got a, a nice smile. And, uh, but uh, un, un, underneath that, there's all sorts of things going on in their family life which they would probably uh, be, prefer not to talk about. Yes, Nick. But this is the amazing thing about Jesus. He said, come to me, all ye who are burdened, burdened from the things that have happened in your life. And he promised, I will give you rest. So what would you say is the, the answer, John, um, in terms of what, what we, we need to do in order to experience this, this love, this forgiveness? I think one of the most common thing about us all is that we all need forgiveness. At some point in our lives, we have offended somebody, and at some point, others have offended us. But there is someone who says, come to me, no matter how difficult your life has been, no matter how burdensome it has been, I am ready to forgive you. And I am ready to have this relationship with you that has no end. I must say this, Nick, that it is in God that we find true and sincere forgiveness and the ability and the strength to forgive those who offend us. Um, that's true, John. I guess the greatest example of all uh, is Jesus himself, isn't it? Yes. I, several years ago, I had the opportunity of seeing a movie titled The Passion for the Christ. I have never seen so much brutality in my entire life. Although I was born during the war in Nigeria, that was in 1968, in the middle of the Civil War. And I grew up understanding brutality, but never have I seen such hatred in my entire life. But some, something amazed me. At the end of all the brutality, he looked to God, his father. He knows how angry his, his father is, and he can get. And he says, Father, forgive them. The same people that tore down his kingdom, the same people that bruised his king, the same people that tore all that he stood for, that called him names, that spat upon him, and he looked straight at their faces and says, God, please forgive them, for they are not conscious of what they are doing. What an amazing God we have, Nick. That's right. And what is our response, John, to, to, to that, to this, um, this sacrifice on the cross? Well, as we stand today, there is only one expectation. I, I, several years ago in Africa, I remember we used to go to trade things. It's called trade by butter. So you take things of like value and exchange them. But for Jesus, this is not the case. He takes things of greater value and exchange for things of less value, which is me. Mm -hmm. He said, come unto me the way you are. Come, I will give you strength to walk with me. Jesus was not looking for perfect people. He says, I'm looking for people that I, him, Jesus, can make perfect. That's right, John. And, um I think um, uh, it's, it's good to know that we have to respond to that, don't we? Um, I think for myself, the, uh, when I was a teenager, um, a long, long time ago, um, I was uh, quite offensive as a person. And uh, I, I would, was a master of sarcasm. That means the ability to pull people down. And I didn't really want to be the person that I was. And I tried very hard to be different, but I found that that was impossible. Um, there was something inside me that wanted to, to, to change. So what happened? Um, what happened was that I did what you suggested, and uh, the first thing was I simply, very simply, asked God to forgive my sins, things that I'd done, done wrong, and I was very, very aware of those things at the time. But there was more to, that, to it than that. Yes, I think I agree with you, Nick. Sometimes we are the last person to find out when we, are, when we have offended others. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's Definitely. not deliberate. But J Jesus said, 
He said, in talking about offense, we will offend one another. So I think he's having an understanding that we can cause offense. And then we can, by that, take onto Jesus' advice and go to ask for forgiveness from our Father. That's right, John. And uh, I think that there are two incredible things. One is that because Jesus died for us and took all our sins on himself, we can receive forgiveness. It's not enough just to forgive others. We need to receive forgiveness. And I think when we see our own faults, it makes it much easier to forgive others as well. Um, and I think also for me there was this, the, 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 uh, the sense of powerlessness. And um, on that day, when I was uh, 17 years old, um, uh, somebody told me that I could actually ask Jesus into my life. And it wasn't something I did because it was a theory. I thought, okay, that sounds like a, an all right idea. But this incredible change came over uh, my life. And um, I found that, uh, that loving others became the normal thing rather than the, 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 the exception. But can you kind of take me through how you give your life to Christ? What the steps were, <laughs> what you did? What I did. Um, and what Jesus did. Yes, indeed. Well, I mean, uh, what Jesus did was he carried my sins uh, on the cross and he offered me forgiveness. And what I did was I accepted that free gift and I said, Lord, forgive, please forgive me. Um, and then, uh, I, as I said, I very simply prayed a prayer asking Jesus to come into my life. And I was very, very surprised. I didn't expect anything to happen very much. But this, this, this love came into my life, and um, I, I was on cloud nine for a few weeks after that. My life was completely changed, but not completely, maybe. Well, I agree with you. Uh, I'll give you my final story. This was something that happened when I was about nine, ten years old. I had offended my elder brother, and I knew in myself that what I had done was wrong. And my mom called me and said, John, you need to say sorry to your brother. Mm. I didn't want to say sorry because I believe I was justified doing what I had done, even though I knew in my heart that it was wrong. But several years down the line, I know how painful it is because my elder brother, in turn, did something that offended me, and I demanded an apology. And he said to me in simple terms, several years ago, mommy asked you to say sorry, you said no. So it's my turn to say no. <laughs> and that was really hurtful. And that is what it is. When we offend people, we offend our friends and brothers, and we don't want to say sorry. And at the same time, Jesus is saying, I'm giving you an opportunity of eternal grace to say sorry and to be able to accept when others offend you. May I close with on this note? Is it possible to forgive and be forgiven? And if it is, what is the process, Nick? <laughs> okay. Um, I think I, I, I may, may leave the process, John. Um, well, but I'll, I'll just touch on it because we don't want to take too much time. But um, Jesus' solution to bitterness that we all suffer from um, one of the things that he said uh, was that we should love our enemies. Um, he said, pray for your enemies. Do good to those that curse you. And that's very, very difficult, but it's very practical. I certainly found that the first thing is I have to decide I will forgive somebody, even if I don't want to. And I've had to do that many times. And then I think um, uh, I decide that I'm going to do good to that person, but not in such an obvious way. <laughs> that they think, oh, I must have done something really bad to that person. They're being, re they're being very nice to me. Um, and then just, uh, I would actually pray for them. And I think praying for people just puts something in your heart for the other person. So those are three things that I found very helpful, John. Now I agree with you, Nick. It is possible to forgive and be forgiven, but with the help from above. And what will be your thought? Okay, one final thought. Um, I was thinking this morning about, uh, have you seen those um, BBC documentaries about um, hyenas chasing wildebeest and how they track them down? 
And um, th this thought came to me this morning that how they do it is that they, 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 they hunt in packs and then they, um, they isolate the weakest member. So they get a mother with her child, um, say it's a buffalo, a mother buffalo with the child that can't run so well or, or an injured one, and they separate them from the rest of the group and then they attack and they kill them. And the Bible says that the, the, the devil uh, seeks whom he can kill and destroy. And uh, he's not, no gentleman. And in a sense, his tactics are the same, to separate us from the flock. And the thought was really that, really that the church was Jesus' idea. And my wife and I have said uh, many, many times that the church is a safe place. And when we get isolated often through hurt and disappointed from the church and we decide we're not going to go to church, we're going to do our own thing, then we're in a very vulnerable position and we're ready to be picked off. But then there's the coming back to church or coming back to relationships in which we maybe have been hurt and disappointed and that is very difficult. But the, it's worth it. So I would recommend as my final thought that you, we take seriously reconciliation and where we found uh, uh, relationships where we've been offended and disappointed and hurt, find someone. And even here today, we're going to have a lovely lunch in a moment. Um, find someone to talk to. If you're in that situation where you've been offended and it's really, really hard, and maybe somebody could talk with you and pray with you, but don't leave it alone because you're isolating yourself and it's not a good place to be. Is that all right, John? Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John Nick. Fantastic. We're going to finish with our final song, our final.